When discussing fear as a concept or feeling, it's typically a matter of perspective. To a mouse, the cuddliest cat could be the harbinger of doom. To those like me, with an anxious aversion to harsh light and bustling crowds, a stroll through Times Square may as well be a drowning gasp. The same thing goes for works of horror. A Nightmare on Elm Street works in part because of those having their figurative and literal dreams ripped to shreds, are these hopeful teens who are old enough to know nightmares shouldn't kill you, but young enough to maintain an elastic and optimistic command of reality. In these instances, fear isn't an action or a thing, it's a subjective response. So what would happen if that notion was inverted? Situating each of us behind the eyes of its hulking, head-mulching killer, in a violent nature supplants the quivering antipathy of victims and audience surrogates with a voiceless void of compassionless terror. A lumbering natural disaster that would have no feelings whatsoever about the worst day of your life. What is the thing that you're doing? God, he is like some sort of non-giving-up school guy. When his spirit is disturbed by wayward campers, Johnny returns from the grave. As we, the audience, watch over his shoulder, he methodically eradicates those who foolishly broke his slumber. Please! Help! In a Violent Nature's elevator pitch is a novel way to skin the proverbial cat of slasher cinema after 50 years of been there done that nastiness. What if a prototypical supernatural slasher was shot almost entirely from the point of view of the figure dealing out all the death? Now, playing out shots or scenes from a villainous panorama isn't new. Peeping Tom employed POV camera shots to break the barrier between a viewer and an accomplice. <coughs> Halloween, The Terminator, Predator, and 2001 A Space Odyssey employed a first-person adversarial vantage to juxtapose fragile humanity with unblinking nonchalance. Goodbye. The remake of Maniac unfurls entirely through the eyes of a killer, and in doing so makes all of those who watch perversely complicit. What In A Violent Nature manages to achieve when adopting a similar approach is to make an antagonistically coded figure who only communicates through destruction and ceaseless motion into the protagonist rather than the antagonist. While any of the actual plot here is delivered economically and with scant regard for layered complexities, Johnny is given a profile and relatively complete backstory full of childhood injustice and tragedy, a unique and understandable goal, and a traceable arc with a beginning, middle, and end. Conversely, any information that may encourage relatability or affection for his victims is muffled or outright omitted. Their deaths are neither dwelled on nor celebrated, mourned or examined. Instead, the camera often settles into a third-person framing just behind Johnny, establishing a sense of space and relativity no doubt familiar to any of you who've played a video game. The Observer is placed into an exploratory, action-oriented headspace where progress is determined by forward momentum towards a simple objective and the elimination or overcoming of obstacles that may slow or stall said progress. In this instance, Johnny wants to get his mother's locket and needs to make static, lootable objects of these non-player characters so he can do that. Not only does In a Violent Nature buck the traditional victim-centric focal points of the slasher by distantly sidelining them until they're mere stick figures and snatches of incidental dialogue, but it actively adapts its visual style and temporal structure so that we can further immerse ourselves in the otherness of this murderous outlook.
In fact, while much has been made of its hybridization of the slow cinema of Gus Van Sant and Terence Malick, stitched onto the weighty, industrially grungy My Bloody Valentine and Friday the 13th Part 2, the most apt point of comparison here is David Lowry's masterwork, A Ghost Story. Both share a 1.33 to 1 aspect ratio, naturalistic lighting, almost entirely practical effects, and a blend of intrusive voyeurism with an earthy familiarity, all of which comes together to instill something that could be patently ridiculous with a solemn, aching tension. Each also features a divisive scene that abandons the established perspective so that a cameo character can employ a monologue as a thematic skeleton key for anyone feeling subtextually locked out. Most importantly though, both twist and skip chronologically to create a stark observable difference between how time is perceived and space is navigated by the living and the dead. When Johnny makes his first kill, we skip the act itself and jump to what's pertinent to his agenda, his hand moving towards destroying this man's face, match cutting away to viscera-soaked fingers stretching towards his ultimate purpose, reclaiming his mother's locket. The wretched final seconds of one man's life not even registering as a subconscious scratch. Elsewhere, pregnant pauses, protracted steps, and expanses of stimulatory absence are allowed to drag on and play out without editorial interruption. This inconsistent pacing and temporal rhythm serves two important functions. First, it harkens back to the weathered trope of a slow-moving murderer who can paradoxically blindside or catch up with any sprinting prey, suggesting that this undying, lead-footed threat exists beyond the parameters of our mortal time. Second, it's a reminder that whether our end will be quick and clean or seemingly ceaseless slog of gratuitous misery, we have frighteningly little control over how and when that full stop falls. And so it goes. Some of the deaths aren't shown or are cut and dry in their quickness. Others, including potentially the greatest kill in slasher history, seem never-ending in their awfulness. None of this ambient existential horror is delivered in a cold or callous fashion, but instead it's presented as an unknowable, inescapable, and indiscriminate certainty for all living things. <coughs> cold, callous, these are words often used to describe the remorseless murder sprees of the Hannibal Lecters and Patrick Batemans of this genre but none of those words accurately reflect what Johnny is or what he represents. This ceaseless march of unencumbered animalistic savagery is somewhere between a curious child picking petals from flowers and a gust of wind. When he bisects Aaron's head with a draw knife, he's making something loud quiet. At the moment he turns Aurora into a human pretzel or dismembers the park ranger, there is no rage, just curiosity as to the fallibility of meat and bone. Even as Colt is turned to rancid pulp by the wet thumping of Johnny's axe for four unbroken minutes, <laughs> this cause and effect has more instinctually in common with a toddler's tantrum over a lost pacifier than anything approaching a concerted act of knowing evil. In a way, it's naivety writ large in permanent ink a utilitarian drive to return to the comfort and quiet of the Earth's womb, a wanting for the soft, still embrace of dirt over the light and sound of people and their problems. More so, this complete dislocation from empathy speaks to a pertinent truth about the relationship between conscious, cognizant life and the natural world. The Earth may be a warm living place, but it doesn't care whatsoever about how and when you die.
In the opening of Nicholas Rogue's Don't Look Now, a father wails inconsolably as he grips the lifeless body of his drowned daughter. <laughs> Yet, all around him, the birds sing and the sun shines in the picturesque glow of a beautiful afternoon. This reminder that on the worst, most torturous day of any of our lives, the world will continue to move and beauty will abound, is carried throughout almost every frame of In a Violent Nature. There are no non-diegetic sound stings and no superfluous musical score to sell the slaughter, no stylistic flair or filters to abstract or emphasise each stab. Regardless of whether we're witnessing lush greenery or disemboweling terror, the calming thrum of the Ontarian wilderness lilts and whistles at the same enveloping volume. It's an impartial, glacial illustration of entropy, the principle of existence that dictates that any system over a long enough period will tend towards death and disorder. For all intents and purposes, In a Violent Nature is a still pond that is intermittently ruptured by a jagged rock, only for the ripples to dissipate back to an idyllic nothingness. Just as the stars are indifferent to astronomy, the natural world holds no positive or negative regard whatsoever for anything that happens to us. For hundreds of years, human progress has seldom been achieved without the wanton ruination of the environment and the myriad creatures we deem unworthy of preservation. So why should the forests and thickets sway a single inch in response to the reactive obliteration of us? Johnny is, after all, a product of environmental desecration. He and his father were murdered by loggers who were driven to violence by short-sighted capitalistic greed, an injustice that was swept up and buried in the name of commerce. When he emerges from the ground to spill blood, it's like a white blood cell trying to fend off an intrusive virus so that homeostasis can be resumed. By taking up these particular weapons, namely the iron implements of woodsmen and logging crews, and wearing this cowl, an antiquated smoke mask conceived in the wake of man-made forest fires, Johnny is appropriating the tools used to carve up this paradise to force out those who dare disturb it. While none of these allegorical allusions are obfuscated or intended to be difficult to spot, they do make for a sobering yet never pretentious contrast to the textbook teen slasher playing out just off screen. Something's not right, Troy, and you know it. Let's just go to the cops and file a police report or something. One recurring and largely justified complaint about slashers is how translucently thin and one dimensional their victims tend to be where peril and pain are communicated on a level of masochistic gratification rather than any attempt to curry an audience's emotional investment. In a Violent Nature is simply taking that shrugging disregard to its most literal blasé conclusion. You stupid son of What the f you the final girl, the frat bros, the horned up fools, the country bumpkin, and the meddling sheriff, none of whom seem to have peripheral vision or spatial awareness as they deliver their lines with a clunky cornball lack of grace, none of that's about subverting or rejecting horror staples. Good story! <laughs> It's just about cutting the musical accompaniment and dragging the camera off the beaten path. The journey, destination, and travellers are largely the same. They're just taking a less travelled, more curiously winding road to reach the same checkpoints of death, decay, and the one who gets away. If In a Violent Nature's ambient horror and killer perspective were merely a gimmick or marketing ploy to differentiate it from the never-ending mudslide of axe-wielding Drek, 
then all of this would likely fall into charming but cheesy obscurity alongside the barf bags handed out with Mark of the Devil or 13 Ghosts Magical Glasses. <laughs> What writer-director Chris Nash manages to achieve here is to intrinsically bind this core conceit to every meta-moment, subtextual slice, and thematic rumination. To divorce what's happening and why it's happening from this angle of approach would simply erase just about every ounce of weight and conviction there is beyond the rote template of Big Man Smashes Campers. The absence of reaction shots or non-diegetic distractions a myopically shallow depth of field, the lurching thud and protracted pace of Johnny's gait, the intentionally stripped to the bone characterization given to these soon to be arterial puddles, it all serves to alter the audience's perception of what is so often written off as generically evil, whilst highlighting the unmoving indifference of the natural world to our cosmically insignificant problems. It's a testament to just how well this all works that when these aesthetic stipulations and cinematographic rules are broken, much of this brilliance evaporates, and for as much as I admire this film, it is unmistakably flawed in frustrating unfortunate ways. Um, I'm gonna go take a sh for a work so stubbornly committed to a slow, silent crawl, there are pronounced moments where concessions are made, seemingly out of a fear of boring or confusing those chomping in the cheap seats. These include a bafflingly lame CG shot to exposit on Johnny's already established locket MacGuffin, and a few moments where the mordant tension is irreparably released by abandoning the POV on which most of the movie rests for the generic yammering of these nobodies. All of which scuffs up but doesn't strip the shine from this rough cut but entrancing gem. In a Violent Nature embraces a diversity of influences, genre templates, and cliches while stripping away the jump scare sterility and comfortable safety of contemporary, theatrically released studio horror. Leaving behind a hypnotic, harrowing, and gorily severe monolith, that's been following me around since the moment I saw it. A spooky walk in the woods for our Patreon producers Jennifer C, Claire M D, Becky O, Kay Kraus, Jennifer Fetish, and Nicholas Lair Revere, and a weird dude with an axe for all these amazing folks who support us over on Patreon. Have you seen In a Violent Nature? What did you make of it? And sound off in the comments about your favourite slasher movies. The best way to help out this channel is to like, subscribe, and share these videos with your friends, and if you're in a position to do so, please consider checking out our Patreon at the link in the description below, where you can get access to the In Frame Out Film Club, our private Discord, and get your name in the end credits. As always, thank you for watching. Until next time, this is In Frame Out.